Hey everyone, Drew Perot here, host of the Broken Brain Podcast. On today's interview, we have my dear friend, Sarah Ann Stewart, and her doctor, Dr. Suzanne Kim, talking to us about something called breast implant syndrome. Super fascinating, stay tuned. Welcome to the Broken Brain Podcast. I'm your host, Drew Perot. Each week, we'll invite a new guest or guests who we think can help you improve your brain health, feel better, and live your best life. Today, we have two guests here in our studio with us, my dear friend, Sarah Ann Stewart, and my new friend, Dr. Susan Kim. A little about Sarah. Sarah Ann Stewart is a certified holistic health practitioner. Sarah runs a leading mindfulness-based private coaching practice here in Los Angeles. Her unique heart centered approach has helped hundreds of women permanently lose weight and heal their relationship with food and their bodies. Sarah is the founder of the Awesome Inside Out Movement, an advisor to international wellness brands and a soon to be Hay House author. A little bit about Dr. Suzanne Kim. Dr. Kim is a board certified family physician and has been in practice for 19 years. Her passion is to empower and advocate for her patients in their pursuit of optimal health and wellness. Currently, she's the medical director of Infusio in Beverly Hills, where she treats patients with chronic degenerative diseases using whole mind-body approach, which also includes the application of stem cell-based therapies, genetics, peptides, and much more. Sarah and Dr. Kim, thank you for joining us on the Broken Brain Podcast. Thank Thanks you for having so us. much for having us. Absolutely. It's an honor to have you here and talk about this important topic. So I'm going to jump right into it. Mm -hmm. So Sarah, I'd love to start off with your journey a little bit. Yeah. You are a holistic practitioner, mm -hmm. coach. You work with people. You breathe. You live, mm -hmm. breathe, eat, sleep, yeah. wellness. Yes. And you teach others how to be healthy. Yes. But you yourself were suffering from some mysterious symptoms that right. you could not get to the bottom of. Take us through a little bit of that. Right. So it's really ironic, right, that I'm teaching people about body love and body positivity. And yet I had this journey where I suffered from several years of breast implant illness. And what that looked like was in 2009, I decided while I was modeling at the time, a very long time ago in a past life, I decided to keep, I wanted to continue to keep my career going. And to do that, I was transitioning from more of an editorial look to a commercial look, and I decided to get implants. And I basically just sold my car and overnight like went in, got some implants, and didn't ever think about the repercussions of these implants. I never thought about what could happen from them. I never thought about the, the health side. I never was warned about what could potentially come of you know, getting implants. I was also told that the FDA had just recently cleared silicone implants again. So I basically had chosen the ones that looked, that had a different look, the, the gummy, the gummy texture. Um, at that time, um, I had no, yeah, no understanding of what was ahead of me. And 2016, while I was in Tulum, during the middle of the night, I started experiencing severe heart palpitations. And how much, how, uh, I think you originally was, had your implant in 2009? Yes. Yes. Yeah. So, so about seven years later. Seven years later. Yeah. I started developing these severe heart palpitations in the middle of the night, and I woke up in a severe panic. And the heart palpitations continued to get worse. And I thought, maybe it's because I'm traveling. I'm not sure. So I went home, and I started researching and just trying to understand what could be happening for me in my early 30s like what could this be and over the next two years i developed a series of just severe severe symptoms um, everything from brain fog memory loss um, i developed rashes acne um, autoimmune like symptoms where i would my i would have pain and joint pain i had pain under my armpits i um, developed my my fingers would get cold and i would like have no feeling in my hands the symptoms went on and on, and there were 30 of them that I tracked. And basically, I was just in complete fear. I had no idea what was happening. I went to dozens of doctors, plastic surgeons, with absolutely no answers. I got testing, absolutely no answers. And then I started to see that other women were getting sick from their implants. And from a very ego-based place where I was at the time, I was in denial and was like, it can't be my implants, it can't be my implants. Mm. So I kept researching more and more and more and trying to dive into what is the problem. And then finally, I met Dr. Kim at Infusio and had had some other people reach out to me. And that was the point where I finally said, okay, this is enough. I have to get these implants out. I'm not going to deny this any longer. Um, but was, what was crazy is that not one doctor before that, not one plastic surgeon, 
after all of the testing I went through, none of the testing had shown up that anything was wrong. And um, and none of them had ever referenced that it could be my implants. Wow. And there's so much there, and we're going to unpack yeah. it all. But I want to go just for a moment to uh, Dr. Kim. Uh, Sarah comes in your office. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that she was seeing another physician there at Infusio and then got connected to you. Uh, you're hearing about her story and her journey. At what moment did you start to feel like you were connecting the dots with what was going on with her health? Right. So Sarah came in and we had our initial visit in March of 2008. And when she started to tell me about her symptoms that she described, uh, you know, I knew, uh, first of all, that this is not normal for someone her age and as young as she is to and have lives as clean and healthy. Right, to, to feel this way. I um, mean, she said she was fatigued to the point of exhaustion. So, you know, when I, and this is very common though, I, I, I tend to see a lot of patients like this. So automatically the bells are going off and I say, okay, there must be something underlying. So what is this root cause? Because we're always looking for root causes of illness uh, because that's what you have to treat, not the symptoms. So in her situation, uh, when she told me that she had breast implants placed you know, I think seven years ago, uh, I automatically considered that it could be the cause, a root cause of her symptoms. So I made the connection pretty immediately about that because I knew that anything, any foreign body um, uh, can cause a chronic immune reaction and as a result can cause all sorts of symptoms, including the ones that she mentioned. Yeah, in fact, you said something uh, really interesting to her is what our uh, team heard from Sarah said. I can give you tools and tricks and, and things that can cover up or help man manage the symptoms, or we can get to the root cause. Correct. Which yeah. is a powerful thing. And so, Sarah, when you first heard that from Dr. Yeah. Kim, and, and she said it was potentially the implants, yeah. what was going through your head? Yeah, I was I, I actually a huge relief like huge relief and just so much gratitude that a doctor was willing to actually speak this like in complete honesty and transparency for me because to me because I kept going to doctors and asking them could it be my implants I had met with different plastic surgeons and different functional and integrative doctors and they were like let's try all these other things like let's do the testing let's make sure it's not autoimmune let's make sure it's not your thyroid and and no one had put the two together and so finally all of the stories that I had been hearing online because I had heard um, Crystal, Crystal Hefner's story and I heard these stories of these big celebrities coming out and saying it was their implants still in denial but yeah I hadn't heard a doctor actually tell me with confidence with confidence that like this actually could be it and I can't guarantee it but like why not try you're this sick like you've done everything mm -hmm. and you've been trying to cover up all of your problems to this point and I had been doing you know numerous supplement protocols getting IVs doing glutathione injections like I was spending so much money and yet I was getting worse and my health was declining rapidly so at that point it was it was like a breath of fresh air where I was just like someone believes me and and this is like why not why not do this for so long I thought like okay well if I spend all this money and it doesn't work then then I was wrong and you know I was like concerned about that but at this point at being you know completely not able to get out of bed in the morning I couldn't work I I was just like I will try anything at this point and then I ended up scheduling um, uh, a doctor right away and going in for the first um, initial visit. Dr. Kim, where did that confidence come from? Uh, you know, one of the things that Sarah uh, and I have talked about just in passing is just how many practitioners out there, even in the holistic and functional medicine mm -hmm. and integrative world, don't have a lot of experience mm -hmm. with foreign objects or breast implants and patients who have triggering of effects or cascading of symptoms that come from that. Where did your confidence come from that you felt comfortable to suggest that this could be the culprit? Well, again, as I mentioned, I'm always looking for root causes. And so, uh, you know, I was familiar that like with in dentistry, you can have root canals and implants, uh, not implants, cavitations that can uh, trigger the immune uh, system and so and, and kind of preoccupy the immune system and result in a whole host of symptoms. So similarly with um, breast implant, um, it triggers this chronic immune response and as a result you have the appearance of all these different symptoms. So I you know just knowing that I know that it's possible and because her other her history really didn't give me any uh, uh, 
information that I would, you know, lead me to another type of uh, other type of root illness, uh, I decided that there's really good likelihood that this was her underlying cause. Because I always take a very detailed history to make sure I can see, you know, so I always check about the teeth, implants, any other foreign um, bodies. Uh, so kind of really looking for what are those things that are going to, uh, you know, trigger the immune response uh, or uh, continue um, uh, illness in a patient. So and had you had any experience prior with any patients who uh, also were suffering through uh, breast implant syndrome? Uh, well, and actually, she, I think that she was one of the first patients. Subsequently, I've had other patients who've come to me who you know, have had uh, implants who I've mentioned to them as well. You know, they, if you don't get, don't get better with treatments, it may be the implants. Because I think initially, patients... Uh, have a hard time necessarily accepting that. So I just mention it. And then, you know, she was very open. But some patients that takes a little longer to sink in and to accept that this could possibly be the cause of their illness. Yeah. So it's not until you get really sick right. <laughs> then you're willing to consider getting, you know, because again, it is a big deal. Yeah. It's a it big is deal. It's a big deal, and there's mm -hmm. so many layers that are involved in it. And Sarah, I want you to just touch on that for a minute. Yeah. You had a friend actually earlier on in your journey say, like, hey, maybe some of your symptoms could be related to, yeah. I think you said you had a friend bring it up. Yeah. Um, and it's not that you had never heard about the concept before, right. but Talk about that. Why is it such a big deal and what goes through your head? Yeah, it's it's definitely not just about the physical, right? There's right. this whole emotional component where we you spend a lot of money to get your implants in and you like the way they yeah, look. You sold and your I, car. Yeah, I sold my car. And it was like one of those things where I wasn't even thinking about it. It was just like, okay, this is what I'm gonna do for my career. And then and then they become part of your body. And it's actually a very emotional journey. And I don't think women think about that before they get them in. I don't think they think about what it's going to be like getting them out like they are implants don't last your whole life so at some point you're going to have to get them out you're going to have to either get them replaced or removed and that's that's it's a, it's emotional and um it was very hard on my work it was very hard financially it was very hard in my relationship just from what i went through a couple weeks after my explant i got very depressed and sad and had to go through this whole process of really recognizing that my body looked different um i don't think those are the things we're talking about culturally we're not talking about what actually happens after the implants come out and so it was a process for sure and it was something that i'm grateful for and i've grown from it and i love my body even more now but but it definitely is is that challenge right you're going to look different and, and you don't know how you're going to look after you get them out and so whether you get a lift or fat transfer or whatever you th there's just a lot of what ifs and the what if of what if i don't get better right and so for me it was just non-negotiable and my health was I, I finally got to a place where it was like my health is so much more important than than how i look at this moment in my life and to speak openly like it had prevented me from getting pregnant because i had heavy metals i was sick like this is something i wanted to start a family and now i'm looking at you know two years out now at a place where i finally can can start a family but it prevented that but we don't talk about that we don't think about that when we go mm -hmm. under the knife or we think about just having a doctor you know put a few few things you know put something in us we don't think about that it's actual plastic and it's leaking chemicals and it could break and there's a capsule. Like we don't think about all the repercussions. Mm, absolutely. And it's not that it's just a simple process to go get them right. removed. Right. There's a lot that goes into it. I would love right. for both of you to talk about uh, just some of the expectations that Dr. Kim, you set of things that Sarah would have to start thinking about mm -hmm. um, after schedule. So you scheduled an expert explant mm -hmm. you were referred to uh, a surgeon mm -hmm. i think by infusio um or... there were a couple of women who had come through infusio that um went to dr castleth across the street yes. but it's very very challenging to find a doctor that does explant surgery and in a way that actually removes the entire capsule so an end block mm -hmm. surgery is where you remove the entire capsule all the scar tissue and the um implant at the same time and this prevents basically the biofilm from being left in your body so a lot of times a biofilm is created around the implant and that's what's actually causing people to get sick so you need to find a doctor who is well versed that understands breast implant is, that's open-minded and i think 
I believe that you need to find someone who actually believes that breast implant illness is an actual problem because then they know the steps to take to make sure that they get everything out when they remove all the tissue so that nothing is still left in your body that could continue to cause the sickness. I've seen a lot of women, I've heard a lot of stories of women who just get the implant removed and then they're still sick because they don't realize that the entire capsule has to come out and then they have to go back in for another surgery. Dr. Kim, you've, you've mentioned you know the analogy of teeth and we often see this with teeth too. We, we had Dr. Rosita Rashian, who's my dentist here in Los Angeles, come on the podcast and talk about, well, just because you have mercury in your teeth, we have to make sure that it's removed properly. Because if you go to a regular dentist and they remove the mercury, you could actually be exposed to even more mercury through the vapors mm -hmm. and the drilling process. So they have to use a very specific methodology of putting a, a gas mask on you and then having you maybe do a little bit of a detox afterwards. For what you were familiar with, mm -hmm. what were the things that you were thinking about uh, for Sarah as a patient? It's not just going and getting them removed. What were some of the other components around it to uh, make sure that there weren't lingering effects that you were thinking about in putting a protocol together for her? Sure. So uh, a lot of women who have breast implant illness uh, can be very symptomatic and ill. So before they can even go get an explant, uh, they need to be pre-treated uh, to remove, help re reduce some of the toxin load um, to get their immune system improved. Otherwise, the stress of the surgery could make them worse. So uh, I think Sarah did do some pre-treatments with us in order to... Uh, uh, improve her overall health status before going in. To boost the immune system, would you mind sharing a little bit? And by the way, anything you don't want to share about, just say yeah, yeah. you know that. But anything that you can give to our listeners that would be a good example of that mm -hmm. would be would be helpful. Sure. Well, uh, we don't we don't like to say boost the immune system. We actually what happens is there's a dysregulation of the immune system, so the ratio uh, of the immune cells get gets unbalanced. So what we do is uh, immune modulation. We call it to help rebalance the ratio of the different types of immune cells that are available. Uh, so we. I don't know if Sarah did this actually, um, because we have lots of different treatments. Sure, you can talk about uh, but options. we did do, yeah. So we do thymus extracts because thymus extracts do um, a, a very good job of helping to rebalance um, mm -hmm. that immune ratio. And so I did. Yeah, yeah. We did. did we yeah. Did so she did do injections. We did mm -hmm. IVs. We did. Uh, inject, yeah, we did those. Right. Like so she did a number of she did a number of treatments. Chamber. <laughs> we did, we did <laughs> <laughs> well, we did specifically target what um, what we found in her. So what we do initially in all our patients is something called a global diagnostic scan. Now this is a type of electrodermal testing uh, that. Um, and this the one this one is particularly from Germany. Uh, and how these uh, type of devices work is they transmit a small current into the body, uh, so similar to like an EKG. But you can control the amplitude and frequency that is uh, transmitted. Uh, so what it will do is it will look transmit a frequ certain frequency and then look for an echo that comes back. Now we know that cells resonate at certain frequencies. So, and these frequencies are actually stored in the device. Uh, so it can, for example, transmit the frequency of uh, bacteria. And then it looks at the echo that comes back. And if that echo is strengthened, um, it can indicate the presence of that bacteria. So it, this device can also look at inflammation, look at uh, the function of individual organ systems, and then how they work together. So it really gives us a lot of information very quickly because the whole scan takes maybe about eight minutes to do. So in and Actually, I came to Infusio one time a long time ago. And uh -huh. they, uh, did you have it? I, I had the scan. Oh, you did? Okay. And... Uh, I think, I, I mean, some small stuff here and there, but uh, this is really, you know, just as, sorry, I cut you off, so please continue. Oh, no, that's okay. Well, so Sarah had a scan, and that actually really did point to kind of, kind of coincided with what her symptoms were. So she had problems in her immune system, and she had problems in her digestive system. She had problems in her organs of detoxification for her, which were the liver and uh, the lymphatic system. She had elevated uh, toxins, including heavy metals, uh, and and she also had low levels of certain nutrients, including calcium, magnesium, trace minerals, and glutathione. So putting that all together, it kind of fit 
uh, the picture that, you know, this mm -hmm. could be from her breast implants as well. So that was giving me that confirmation that, yeah, this really, because honestly, her global diagnostic scan was looking De definitely abnormal uh, for so especially for someone her age you would expect her to be vibrant and you know not have these type of issues uh, but you know when you see something like that you know there's you've got problems yeah. <laughs> so. and I just want to add in that you know a lot of these treatments ozone uh, this global diagnostic you know a lot of them coming out of Germany other stuff like this is very cutting edge and very new Mm -hmm. That's out there, at least in the practice in the in the U.S. And my hope is that it gains gets more steam, and we can have more studies around this stuff and that. But it's very much what maybe from the outside people would see as like fringe medicine, but from the inside you understand it. it's like innovative, it's next level. Mm -hmm. And even I would say a lot of functional medicine practitioners are not as familiar about these mm -hmm. techniques. Uh, so definitely for anybody listening, you know, do your research, go into it, get educated, like all aspects. But the other aspect that's out there is that. These things are not always cheap and straightforward right. to do. Correct. So a big part of this podcast is like, let's make sure everybody is aware of right. what they're, what decisions they're making mm -hmm. uh, so that they know that they're, what repercussions could possibly right. be there down the line with, with uh, if they're going to have implants or if they're going to have something like a root canal or something else that's mm -hmm. available there and uh, how great that Infusio is a resource for people who want to get to the root cause. Because Sarah, in your experience, you had gone to other functional mm -hmm. medicine practitioners and people right. that just you were not getting to the root of what was going on. Yeah, we weren't getting to the root because most people aren't. I mean, most doctors aren't educated in breast implant illness. Like they aren't aware of it. And most plastic surgeons, whether they know about it or not, aren't going to admit to the fact that breast implant illness is really an issue. And they have women coming in that are sick. And so even when I went to have conversations with these doctors, I asked very specifically, like, are these symptoms, could they be related to my breast implant? You know, is there any possibility? And it was always no. And so for me, it was mm -hmm. like I was hearing from other women, but then also, you know, you're, you're hearing from other women that are getting better, but your doctor in front of you who you're trusting over and over is saying no, which then I had to become the advocate for my own health, right? I had to really say, my symptoms are telling me something that my test results aren't. And I'm not crazy. And I'm not crazy. And <laughs> although I have these symptoms and the doctors aren't, you know, seeing them in my test results, I'm not going to stop. Like, I'm not going to stop searching for what the actual problem is, even if it's emotional, even if it's like, even if something else is happening that's manifesting in my body, like I'm going to continue to search. And then I met a friend who had gone to Infusio who had Lyme disease and he said, maybe you have Lyme. And that was when the moment I heard, okay, this is a German clinic. I remember my father had cured himself of cancer using ger a, a treatment out of Germany and different, um, different foods. And so it kind of just fit where I was like, I'm willing to just try something else. I'm willing to go the woo, -woo the like the new age, the, like the things that other people might not have the science, right? That we haven't proven yet to, to do whatever, results. to get the results, to do whatever it takes. And that's when I was like, fully on board of just like, okay, what do I need to do to get this better? And you know, this, I think this isn't, in, in my research that I was doing for this, uh, this isn't something that's new. The no. first woman that had uh, a breast implant, it happened in 1962, her name was Timmy Jean. And uh, it wasn't until 1980s that she started experiencing symptoms. Mm -hmm. So this doesn't happen right away. Mm -hmm. And we're gonna talk about that in the studies and the safety of it. Mm -hmm. um, and after she started experiencing symptoms in 1980, she went back to uh, the plastic surgeon who developed the technique, um, uh, Dr. Uh, Guerra, I think his name is. And uh, she, they said that uh, implants are as harmless as water, mm -hmm. is what they told her. And they said it must be something else. She went to a bunch of different practitioners and they told her that it was something psychosomatic. So she started seeing a psychiatrist. Mm -hmm. And after seeing a psychiatrist, uh, they said that she was diagnosed with some sort of low grade fever uh, and she just needed to you know, deal with that. Essentially, they told her it was all in her head. Mm -hmm. uh, Dr. Kim, let's talk about the safety of implants and as like a larger context, just anything for an object that we would put in our body. Sarah went to her other doctors or surgeons and they said, this is safe. Um, why is it that you think that uh, people and a lot of practitioners feel that this is safe and where can should be should where should we be asking questions based on what data is out there? Mm -hmm. 
So there is definitely data out there. Now, the FDA has even said that, you know, these implants are not, uh, they don't last forever. Um, so they're, but they're meant as temporary devices. So they are going to uh, have chemical degradation and wear out. So, you know, we know that. So it's, uh, it's in interesting that that's not mentioned to women when they get them. Because, and, and again, it may, it's possible that it's, mentioned briefly or it's in the consent, you know, three-page consent form. Right. Um, but, Very you know, it might be not quite in the limelight of the patient because they're just focused on getting the implant. Mm -hmm. uh, so I think that uh, the, the, there's definitely uh, safety, uh, safety risks associated with implants. Now, the ones that are most commonly known, you know, capsular contraction, that's very common. I think a lot of women know about that. Right. So what can happen is you can get scar tissue formation around the implant and then it gets hard and can cause chronic pain uh, in the patient. Um, also, another risk is that because most of these implants are placed underneath the muscle, you have to cut the muscle to get it underneath there and that can weaken that muscle, uh, which then causes the other muscles in the chest to have to take up that slack, um, and that can create chronic chest pain or shoulder pain. Uh, so these uh, are, are very common complaints of um, women uh, with breast implants. Uh, but there's also a rupture rate, which uh, can be as high as 40% with some of these, although those higher ones have been taken off the market. Um, but according to researchers, they found that about 15% uh, have the uh, likelihood of rupturing between the third and 10th year. So I, that's a risk that I think many women may not consider uh, when they, at the time they get their implant. Uh, now the saline ones, uh, when they rupture, you know, salt water can just uh, get absorbed through the body. Uh, but we know that with the issue with saline implants is that uh, they're usually not hermetically sealed and there can be an issue with a valve. So it is possible for the patient's own body fluids to go in and out. And you can, uh, and there recently there have been some studies showing the growth of um, bacteria as well as mold in these saline implants. Now for the silicone gel implants, uh, the when that ruptures, uh, the immune system uh, will try to uh, uh, Break it break, down? No, we'll try to isolate, isolate. that the, the silicone. And it can form what's called these silicomas. And those silicomas can actually uh, travel throughout the body. So uh, that's, uh, that's what the silicone implants. So, uh, and then one, uh, it can also, the, these implants can also cause cancer. Uh, so there's a rare form of cancer. It's not common, but... It's still something that women should be aware of. Um, it's called anaplastic large cell lymphoma, which yeah, is a form. The FDA actually put out a whole right. statement they about it. They put a whole it. statement, right. Mm -hmm. So it's a form of non-Hodgkin's lymphoma that forms in the um, capsule, a scar, scar capsule um, adjacent to the implant. Uh, but also in um, 2001, the National Cancer Institute uh, found that women with breast implants have a significantly elevated uh, incidence of uh, stomach cancer, vulva, brain, and leukemia. So there are also additional risks there um, as far as cancer. I think the bigger thing is that, you know, the doing studies and people going and researching and following up with patients, you know, usually the ones that have the most motivation are gonna be the industries that are making money off of it. So right. their, their studies mm -hmm. are gonna be slightly skewed. In, in fact, the National Center for Health Research, which is a nonprofit, mm -hmm. nonpartisan organization, has a whole page where they talk about questioning mm -hmm. some of the research and the studies that prove that breast implants are completely safe. Right. One of the things that they bring up is that a lot of the industry studies that have been funded are of individuals who have had uh, their implants only for a few months or a few years. Many of the women in their studies had their implants in much lower than the average of what they would like to see of eight years or more of having these uh, in. And for, for Sarah, for you, yeah. you said it was 2009 and then it was 2016 that your, that your symptoms, symptoms started. first started yeah. showing up. So it's not an instantaneous thing. So if you look at a population set mm -hmm. of women right away, it may not fully right. have. The, the second mm -hmm. thing is that a lot of those studies rely on 
um, medical diagnosis reported at hospitals rather than symptoms. What you were going through, if you would have went to a hospital, Sarah, they wouldn't have diagnosed you with anything. Right. So you wouldn't have been reported inside of the data. Instead, you were just feeling not good mm -hmm. and nobody could piece it together. But uh, Dr. Dr. Uh, Kim, going back to your statement, I think the standard sort of industry response, and we see this time and time again, is that, well, nothing has definitive, definitively proven mm -hmm. that this causes this. And those types of studies are actually very difficult to do because it's not that breast implants are making only one thing happen in the body, they're making a cascade and it could be different for different patients. Correct, so all the symptoms don't fit neatly into a recognized diagnosis or like a code that you can code for. So because of that, uh, there is no diagnosis that can be made. It's just a constellation of symptoms. Uh, so this is why it's commonly mis underdiagnosed or misdiagnosed. And if we're looking, if there's, you know, surgeons that are listening to this, you know, what what is the gold standard? We're, we're probably not gonna have a study one day that exactly says that breast implants lead to this exactly. Uh, that would be a very difficult thing to do. And even for a lot of individuals, it would be, it would be their, their actual symptoms, as you said, are not gonna be neatly wound up into just one specific, uh, one specific thing. So, oh, go ahead. Well, actually, so one thing I do want to mention is that as far as who gets ill from the, you know, these breast implants and how quickly they get ill, uh, it's similar to when I see other people with chronic diseases. Uh, it, generally, there is a genetic predisposition. Okay, and this genetic predisposition usually involves poor detoxification pathways or inability to methylate, which is very common, or inability to reduce oxidative stress. Uh, so a lot of these underlying issues can you know, determine why some women might get breast implant illness sooner or, um, or not even get it uh, because there are women I've seen who've had them for a very long time and, um, and are fine. So it's not that every single person who has uh, a breast implant will get breast implant illness. I, I think we should mention that. But I do think that uh, it does you know, definitely uh, can cause this chronic uh, stimulation of the immune system, which was actually found in a study done in Israel. Uh, so they found this chronic stimulation of the immune system. So if you are able to handle that and you've got good pathways, your know, detox pathways are open, they're working well, you're methylating well, you're doing all these things very well in your body, then uh, you're, you know, you're able to keep up with that. But as we age, that's when you know your immune system can get weaker. And then, you know, and again, I've met women who you know, are older, <laughs> who have their implants still, and they most of them really uh, regret have having them, especially now that they're older, and, and that can have more of an impact even at that age as they get older, which is unfortunate because you know you it's going to be a lot harder to deal with it probably when you're older as well. Absolutely. So I want to come back to your story, Sarah, mm -hmm. because uh, you know there was this question in the back of your head, which was okay, I'm being confidently told by this doc, by, by my doctor, mm -hmm. uh, that this could be at the root issue. Mm -hmm. There's no guarantees, it's yep. different for every patient. So you scheduled uh, an X plan and you were doing this pre-prep and other work. How, takes through the process and when you first started to notice a shift in your symptoms? After getting them After getting them removed. It. Yeah, so immediately. I'm like absolutely immediately within the day, like all of a sudden my chest pain, I had severe chest pain, like a heaviness on my chest. And within, you know, eight hours of the surgery and being home, I was already feeling better. Um, the biggest thing that happened within two weeks was my chronic fatigue was gone to the point where I could actually get out of bed and I wasn't having to go take a nap at 3 p.m. every day. Um, I could actually stay up until I needed to go to bed at night. It was like, it was just all of a sudden my, I had my life back, which was so incredible. And I was just so thankful. There were some symptoms that lingered on and that was the heavy metals. And I continued to have joint pain for quite some time. I did a heavy metal challenge and I found that um, my lead, my thallium, my K, uh, 
cadmium and uh, mercury were very high. And these are four of the heavy metals that are found in the implant that I had. Um, and so I had to go through a process of detoxifying this metal out of my body through or metals out of my body through Dr. Kim's help. Um, and that was something that the symptoms did take a little longer, but my acne went away, my rashes went away, my migraines went away, the brain fog, the memory loss, all of those things started clearing up within three to four months. Um, and it was just so incredible to see that I had, yeah, that I had my life back. Wow, that's incredible. And just listening to that story and just everything you've gone through. Um, I wanna talk about detox for a second. Mm -hmm. uh, so Dr. Kim, there's these lingering effects, even if you take out an, uh, a foreign object inside the body, there can be these lingering effects. You know, sometimes people hear the word detox and they can think like fad, trends, this, but there's actually, detox is a, is a process inside the body and we sometimes have to support the body. So Correct. in Sarah's instance, what, you know, uh, a lot of these uh, pollutants or, or heavy metals, they're persistent organic pollutants. They can get lodged in fat cells and tissue and the body can retain them and they can be causing all sorts of disruptions to cells. So when you were putting her on a detox uh, process, uh, medically supervised, what was, the, what was the approach? And what was the outcome that you were trying to drive in the body? Well, my general approach to detoxification is to support the body's own detoxification abilities because the body is remarkable and it's able to detoxify uh, but sometimes it can get overwhelmed and just need support. So the main organs of detoxification, number one, the liver is probably the most important. And then uh, the kidneys, uh, the lymphatic system, the skin, the respiratory system. So all these different organs play a role in detoxification. So in her situation, as I mentioned earlier, she was having issues with the liver and the lymphatic system. So what we did in that situation, we did do... Uh, IV glutathione for her, which can help with the phase two detoxification process of the liver to package those up and get them out. Uh, and then we also supported the lymphatic system. So the lymphatic system, for people who don't know, is like the sewer system of the body. And things can get clogged in there because uh, it depends on movement. Right, which uh, is why exercise is so beneficial because <laughs> exactly. it moves the lymphatic fluid. Because unlike the circulatory system where the heart is pumping and getting the blood to move, the, uh, what happens is that uh, blood gets um, dumped into the lymphatic system. The lymphatic system doesn't have that pressure. So it really depends on movement. So it's easy for things to get stuck in there. So what we did for her is we did, she did actually lymphatic massage uh, to help um, get that moving. Now the lymphatic system uh, lies superficial uh, right underneath the skin. So it's a very light type of massage. It's not like a deep tissue massage that needs to be done. So that we, we use that and she also did the, uh, did you do the slimionic or no? Yeah. You did? Okay. So we have a uh, device in the uh, office called a slimionic. This one comes from Germany and it looks like a little suit. Uh, pressure suit that you put on. It comes up about mid-abdomen, um, and it creates these waves of pressure that basically squeeze and compress uh, the lymphatic system to kind of get it moving. So we use that as well, and uh, and then... Uh, and I, genetic testing. We did that. Right, so, so those were for the organs yeah. of detoxification. Yeah. Then, then we went ahead and uh, we did the metal testing, mm -hmm. which... Uh, we did because her global diagnostic scan, when we rescanned her, uh, the heavy metals were still high. Yeah. So uh, that global diagnostic can't always tell me if it's acute or chronic uh, issue. So the fact, though, that she had elevated metals at the first scan and she still had elevated metals despite having the implants removed, uh, despite uh, doing all the things that we had been she had been doing, we went and did the heavy metal testing and... Uh, sure enough, she showed up with an elevation of heavy, different four different heavy metals. So we're having her do some suppositories in the situation because it's easier to do, and she can do that at home uh, with some DMSA and EDTA suppositories to help uh, bind up the toxins and get them out of her system. Uh, so the final thing that uh, I did for Sarah is we ran a analysis of her 23andMe genetics since she had already had one done. Uh, so looking at that, and that's taking the raw data that you get from them, and you. you I dump run it, it through into a, a system, software program, yeah, a software right? Program. 
So there's a lot of different software programs out there, and you know some of them you can just do yourself online. Right. Um, the one I have is very thorough. Um, so just and there's a lot of findings, but just to mention the ones uh, related to detoxification, she had a number of issues in her detoxification pathways. Um, not as you know maybe not as bad as some I've seen, but she did have the MTHFR mm-hmm. uh, gene mutation, just one, um, and the A1. Um, 679, is it? <laughs> A1298C. Okay, so which is important for methylation. So we we gave her some methylation support uh, to help uh, with that. And the reason why that's important is because uh, the methylation is necessary for the phase two liver detoxification. So again, that's where she had shown up where there was an issue. So just giving her that natural support, and she doesn't have to keep coming and doing, you know, some glutathione IVs now. She's able to support her own uh, liver's ability to detoxify. She also showed up with a mutation, uh, what's called the PON1 gene, which can make it harder for uh, a person to detoxify pesticides. So she may be more vulnerable to um, pesticides. Uh, And we did also, I forgot to mention, we did talk about diet the very first visit, Mm -hmm. um, which again, she's already familiar with, but we, you know, definitely have a conversation with all of our patients about that uh, because we want to make sure we're reducing the exposure to these toxins uh, so that you're not, you know, we're not just looking at the ones that are already there. We just want, we want to prevent continued exposure and accumulation of toxins from um, outside. Uh, so then she also had a mutation in um, what's called the SOD and catalase genes. And these two are uh, responsible for making enzymes that uh, reduce uh, oxidative uh, stress uh, or free rad- oxygen-free radicals. Uh, and lastly, she uh, did have some variations in her glutathione genes. There's a variety of them. And it wasn't enough where I felt like she needed to be on glutathione. But there is a NRF2 uh, supplement, which can help to increase glutathione levels when there is increased levels of oxidative stress. Mm-hmm. So I, I gave Sarah this one because you know there, there may be times when she does need that glutathione if there is increased oxidative stress for whatever reason. So that will just turn on the production of the glutathione. Sarah, was this ever just a lot, like too much for you to handle? Not like specifically the supplements, the genes, all this stuff, but just like being in your healing journey. Yes. You know, I'm sure people are listening for it. And obviously, I think you started feeling a little bit better, but just mentally was this yes, a lot for you. Yes, and I shared before, there were a couple of weeks that were pretty, some of the lowest points of my life because I've studied functional medicine. I've studied holistic health. I know what it, you know, I know the basic things to be healthy and yet I made a choice and I can't blame anyone else for that choice. It was, it was a choice that I made. And so it took me a while to really confront that the repercussions, the symptoms, everything that I was facing was because of a choice that I made to not do an extended amount of research around this. And not that the research would have been there. We're fortunate now that we have technology and the internet and social media and all these women around the world are speaking out. There's a group on Facebook of 50,000 women who are all going through this. I mean, 50,000 women. It's massive. 300,000 women every year are getting implants. And so, and and a group alone that, and I'm sure there's thousands of other women that haven't found that group or, or haven't found out about this yet. But I am just like so grateful for that group. I'm so grateful for the women who are speaking out, for the women who are talking about this because Again, like I don't know even back then if I would have done the research, would I have found anything? Would it have changed my mind? And now I feel like so many women have come to me who were going to get implants that aren't. I have eight friends just within my community of friends, all women who have implants that are have BII that are getting them out. I have had hundreds of women reach out to me all sick with breast implant on this from just posting on social media. And so just the massive amount of women who are suffering from this is is heartbreaking. And I'm grateful that I'm sharing my story and I went through it because I hope that it prevents down the road other women. Not necessarily to, you know, I'm not advocating not to get them, but I am advocating that there's warnings put on, you know, you know, before you get them, that doctors are aware of the symptoms and that 
you do your research and you actually know what you're getting into and you know the financial cost, the emotional, mental, spiritual burden that it could be if your body starts to reject them. Mm, I think that's an important thing is that yeah. it's not the, it's the advocacy for information and awareness. You know, in Europe, mm -hmm. they have the precautionary principle. Mm -hmm. So things have to be proven, you know, safe before mm -hmm. they, many environmental, uh, many, many chemicals that are allowed to be here in the U.S. are sometimes banned over there. And I think that the the advocacy work that I think both of you are doing is to have people take their own precautionary principle. Because in the U.S., we have a history of until it gets really, really bad mm -hmm. and it's overwhelming data, and even sometimes then the industry can still push back, you have to be your own CEO. You mm -hmm. have to be the CEO of mm -hmm. your own health and you have to make your decisions and you have to find the information. That's a happening. good example of that is smoking. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> smoking. It was the same way. It, it and even when it was finally uh, declared to be a health risk, it took another ten years for that to really, you know, sink in and for pay, for people to be aware. So again, it's 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 very, it's the same pattern that we see in a lot of um, health related uh, issues where uh, the information might not be there and then i think the same thing is going to happen even though the information gets out it just takes a while for people to get on board and then now you know everybody knows that smoking is bad for you but you know it's gonna and eventually this will happen with breast implant illness but it's gonna it takes so much time <laughs> it takes yeah. time and usually the standard answer is that there's you know if you if somebody goes to a practitioner or, or a surgeon, Sarah, we have a mutual friend who after you posted your story, mm -hmm. I had sent her yeah. about your story. Mm -hmm. And uh, I remember she had gone to talk to to her surgeon mm -hmm. and a few other doctors and they said, no way. There's no way that having implants is yeah. causing this. You should look at this, you should look yeah. at that. Sorry, go yeah, ahead. Yeah, well, I was gonna say, I, I, with, this, with that similar story, I, I had an MRI done to see if my implants were ruptured, very similar to her. And um, and they said they're fully intact. There's absolutely no way that this could be causing them and they're a gel, so they're not leaking. And so I went home and thought, okay, I, have, I had the MRI, everything's fine. And then come to find out when I actually got the explant, my doctor did a pathology report, which I asked her to do. She found out that not only did I have biofilm with a chronic pea acne, um, chronic acne biofilm surrounding the implant, I also had in the tissue foreign material surrounding the implant, meaning that my body was breaking down the implant. So even on the MRI that showed that my implant was fully intact, it was my body was still breaking it down. And now we're seeing that the moment that an implant goes into a woman's body, the body begins to try to break it down because it's a foreign object. So just from that side of it, it's, it's, it's really... You know, it's 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 like incredible that our body is basically trying to protect us by building this capsule around it, and then by trying to break it down. So at some point, you know, your body is going to, I think, you know, down the road, whether it's 10, 20, 30 years, will at some point try to reject these foreign objects that aren't meant to be be there. I know you had a few conversations that were tough with yeah. different people about mm -hmm. this because there's so many emotions mm -hmm. and. There's so much momentum and anything that there's been momentum around for a long time, it's like, well, you know, Walgreens, they don't anymore, but Walgreens sells cigarettes and this person smoked and my grandmother smoked and she lived till 90. There's so much momentum and people have these different stories. So there can be a lot of social evidence mm -hmm. that people have. Yeah. And one of the things I've heard when it comes to, for instance, uh, uh, breast implants, similarly that I hear with uh, a lot of dental concerns like fluoride and mercury is that, if it was that bad, somebody would have done something about it, right? Mm -hmm. And we are sort of, we are those somebody's trying to do something about it. And actually there's a long history of things being really bad with people not doing things about it. Uh, Dr. Kim, have you ever butted heads with other practitioners or people who just feel like um, they're just not getting the story? Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, you know, to tell? Well, you know, so, you know, in my early in my career, I was just practicing general family practice. And, you know, I was one of those, I have to admit it, I was one of those uninformed 
uh, physicians that didn't realize uh, some of the information that was out there. Because when you go through training, you learn specific information, and that's what you hold on to. So it's hard to grasp on sometimes to other information, and then you have to go out there and actually you know, learn it yourself. So I think a lot of doctors kind of you know, accept the information that they're fed or that they've learned in medical school. or uh, And so they have a hard time uh, looking beyond that and getting out of the box. I mean, it's frowned upon too, by the way, to be out of the box. So uh, yeah, I'm way out of the box. And I uh, and, and honestly, I think that the physicians that I've worked with uh, that are all you know practice integrative or out of the box is because uh, most of them have had their own journey with health issues. And so you know, sometimes it gets to that place that you are willing to look outside the box and say, well, this isn't working, so maybe I'll go ahead and try this, you know, homeopathy, or I'll go ahead and try uh, this other uh, acu- well, acupuncture, which acupuncture, I think, um, a lot of people believe in now. But It was woo-woo at one but point But it was woo-woo, right? But now insurance covers it. There's exactly. There's a lot of data. The studies have caught up. And for you, uh, Dr. Kim, was there a health issue, if you don't mind me mm-hmm. asking? What got you to sort of open up and start to become more aware? So for me personally, I had chronic digestive issues. Uh, And I was talking to Sarah Ann earlier before this podcast, how I kind of lived my 30s in a fog. (laughs) Because what happened was I took lots and lots of antibiotics growing up. uh, And starting around my 20s, I started to have lots of digestive issues, reflux, uh, and I started to take um, a proton pump inhibitor. Uh, and I was on it for over 10 years and it wasn't controlling my symptoms and I was still having symptoms and being triggered by different foods that I was eating. So I was getting tired of it and I would, you know, speak to the gastroenterologist and she just said, okay, well double up on that and take some Zantac while you're at it at night. So here I am taking, you know, twice a day proton pump inhibitor, taking Zantac on top of that and still not being controlled. So I said, what is going on? This is, I, I need to, I have to find a solution. I just can't live like this because, you know, you go and you eat something that you think is okay and all of a sudden you don't feel well and your stomach hurts. So that's kind of led me on my journey and started with nutrition. And I think nutrition is the foundation. So I'm glad I found that. Uh, and just making uh, some, you know, nutritional changes was helpful. Uh, then that led me into other areas, homeopathy. I think homeopathy was the was where I got out of the box. Because when I first learned about homeopathy, uh, I actually thought it was like voodoo. <laughs> I was taking a course and I said, oh my goodness, what this is crazy. This doesn't make any sense to me. How is this possible? Uh, so I said, well, you know, I'll just try it. You know, it's not going to be harmful. And it worked. And I'm like, <laughs> wow, this is crazy. It actually works, but I have no idea how it works. <laughs> so, uh, you know, as a result, I, you know, I think you, you know, you can't deny it. I started, and then, you I started, felt it yourself. I felt yeah. it. It was helping me, and I started using it on my family first <laughs> before I used it on patients. Um, and my family members responded, and I said, wow, there is something to this. And then from there, my journey just continued, and I learned about other uh, integrative therapies. I learned kinesiology next, actually. I took a course in kinesiology. And then from there, um, I learned all sorts of, you know, it just kind of exploded after that. And I was completely out of the box after that because I realized, wow, you know, I always reacted badly to any medication. So whether it's, you know, uh, Tylenol or Advil, uh, I I never do well with medications. So for me, it was great because I had no side effects from, you know, taking homeopathics. So uh, eventually I uh, found out that I had like a gluten sensitivity gluten intolerance. Um, and that was a life-changing moment for me <laughs> it, it, because what happened is I came out of my fog. It was literally like, you know, the clouds cleared, the sun came out, and the birds were chirping mm. because I had this heaviness in my head that was always there. It would get worse after I would eat. Uh, I didn't realize what I was eating, um, but it was always worse when I ate, but I couldn't pinpoint it to 
any particular type of food. I thought I had low hypoglycemia, low blood sugar. I would check my blood sugar. It was still, it was fine. <laughs> so, you know, it was this mystery to me, but I knew something was wrong. So when I stopped eating uh, gluten for me, um, again, probably because I had destroyed a lot of my digestive tract from all the antibiotics that I had taken over the years, and then also the medication, the the acid blocker medication I'd taken um, had really taken a toll on me. And and to be honest with you, um, I am doing so much better now, but I still have to maintain. Um, I cannot uh, just eat whatever I want. It's, you know, it's still there. It's, you know, I'm the constantly working on it. Well, really not to the extent, near the extent that it was, but I will still get symptoms occasionally if I'm not careful with what I eat. So again, I'm, you know, in the process of repairing and I'm constantly trying new things on myself. (laughs) Yes. And, and constantly improving. It's, it's, it's pretty amazing. And thank you for sharing that story because I think should we all be so lucky to have a practitioner who is Mm open-minded and has experienced things. So it gets them to kind of let their guard down a little bit about what they learn traditionally and start being a little bit open-minded so thank you for sharing that and sarah you as a as a as a practitioner as a coach um i want to i want to hear more about how mm-hmm. this has impacted you working mm-hmm. with people and yeah. what lessons have come into that but before we jump into that uh dr kim was a crucial part of your story and also you know you're lucky to have a team of yes. practitioners yes. that are there that have uh, supported you um what other pieces of the puzzle did you continue to add in in your journey to recover? Yeah, and I I want to address that I'm talking from a very privileged place to be able to afford all this. And that's why I want to be able to have these conversations because, again, I understand hearing this and saying, like, I can't, I hear from women all day long, like, I can't do all of the things that you did. And so I think that that's why it's really important that we have this conversation. Even the actual explant. Exactly. Okay, exactly. Yeah. So it was cost. like in the twenty thousands, yeah, and so that's was... for the removal, um, the removing the capsule. That was for a lift. That was for you know because you have to do reconstruction because you're basically right. taking your implants out and you're not filling them back in. So yeah. it was very expensive, and so I want to just first recognize that 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 there is a lot of these things. It, it is very challenging to and and even I was up against a wall of like how much do I keep spending? What how much more do I put on credit? cards and and I just wanted to get better and so that's my first thing and that is like all of these things that I have done do cost money and and even my MRI wasn't covered by my insurance and unless it's you know medically necessary your insurance isn't going to cover it and I think that that's an important conversation to have as well is that you get your implants in but then you don't with a credit card or with my car, like the car I sold or, you know, with my last funds in my bank. But I don't think 10 years down the road, I need to make sure I have X amount in the bank to to make sure that I can get these out. Mm-hmm. Sure. And so, um, so I took quite a bit of time off and really took, um, I allowed myself to heal. I slept a lot. I meditated. I did all the things that I do every single day. It really clean. Um, I did a lot of detoxing, saunas, um, I continued to go to Infusio and get treatments. I have been doing the suppositories every night, which is like another thing that I tell women. I'm like, if you really don't, if you really don't want to be doing this, this is like the one thing that you probably not want to want to be doing at night. Um, and I've just continued to take care of myself, and I've seen my health improve. Um, but again, a lot of us don't have that resource, right? We don't have time. We don't have the ability to take two, three months off and say, I really want to get myself better. And so that's another thing to think about is you're going to need time. If if the implants have the impact they did for me, you're going to need the resources and the money and the time and, you know, and it impacts your relationships. And I didn't go out as much and I didn't see people as much. And my friends started to notice and question what was wrong. And I was suffering in silence and didn't want to blame my implants until I knew for sure. Mm -hmm. And so Mm -hmm. I just want to recognize that every area of my life was impacted. And Mm -hmm. luckily that's back and I have my life back, but I just want to acknowledge that because I think people think it's just a physical thing. Okay, get them out, get them. No, it's impacting every area of your life if you do end up suffering from this illness. Mm -hmm. And I think for a lot of people, you know, you you had this beautiful uh, Instagram image because some of this is also 
mental, mm-hmm. emotional, psychological. Mm-hmm. You have an image uh, which is kind of like a before and after, and yes. it's you and your husband Craig, yes. also a dear friend of mine. And you are you're kind of like being affectionate with each other, mm-hmm. and um, and in the first one on the left, it's like uh, me before me with implants, yes. and then on the right, it's me without implants, and and in both captions, it's like we're still in love, love. Right. right? And I think that there that is a concern for a lot of right. women mm-hmm. is that. How will others see me? Mm-hmm. In fact, what's funny, just to go back to this uh, story of uh, Timmy Jean, who went in to get a tattoo removal. I think it was at uh, a university in a teaching hospital in uh, Texas. And they said, you know, we have this new experimental uh, uh, treatment that we're developing. Uh, and it's basically like a be- breast augmentation. Uh, would you be open to be the first candidate for it? Mm-hmm. And she said, wow, yeah. I'll, okay, cool, I'll do it. And I think they would give it to her free of charge. Um, and in her first, uh, there's been many interviews done with her. She was saying that she, after having the surgery done, she, uh, started noticing, she thought she didn't, she knew that there was a difference, but then she, her quote was, uh, men were wolf whistling at me on the street. Now I'm sure back then that was kind of like an endearing way of saying I'm getting a lot of attention. Mm. <laughs> um, but that is a, a feeling right. component right. of will it affect how people perceive me? Will I right. be seen as less beautiful? Will I, will my, how will my partner react? Have other women brought this topic up to you? Yeah, which has been the most profound part of this whole experience for me. And the most eye-opening is just the amount of women who have reached out to me and said, thank you for sharing this. Thank you for sharing your story. And and I am a lot of them are like, my husband got me these implants for a Christmas present. My husband wanted me to get them. You know, he was addicted to pornography and this is what was going to solve the problem. Or he cheated on me and this is what I thought would solve the problem. And mm-hmm. just perf- just really incredible stories of women suffering. And I have so much compassion and, and love for them because I have gone through these similar experiences and feelings in the modeling industry and coming out of the modeling industry. And um, and when I got my implants out, I started to have these feelings. As women asked me, what are your, what is your husband going to think? I started to have these feelings myself. Like, what is he going to think? Is it going to change our intimacy? Is it going to change our life? Like, I haven't asked him what he thinks about this. Like, I haven't even sat down. I just decided to do it, but I didn't have an actual conversation with him. And so it started to pull up and pull these insecurities in myself and I had to really confront them one at a time and say okay I teach this I'm like I talk about self-love all day long and what are the tools that I need to pull from my own bank of knowledge to be able to move through this with grace and ease Mm -hmm. Um, and it is something that I think we have to we have to talk about because it is not no other person is worth your own health like you know and if they're not fully in love with you unconditionally without your implants then my vote would be that that's not the right partnership and so there's a lot of layers to this and it's it's a cultural problem it's a societal problem it's something that we all need to to really confront but um but the more women that stand in their power and take this leap into health before ego health before looks health before what I want to look like that girl on the magazine cover, which I was part of that problem, speaking very openly about that. Um, we're going to actually change culturally what we pay for, right? And um, and that I think is necessary. Think and it seems necessary. like the, you know, I mean, this conversation in these communities have been around for mm-hmm. a long time, but this particularly feels like the right time to really blow this conversation yes. up even further with mm-hmm. the larger conversations around societal images of women mm-hmm. and and what we are and what society, both men and other women, yeah. are subjecting women to conversations of what's important, what really matters. And it, it reminds me of just the analogy, Dr. Kim, you were saying earlier. It's that in your approach to medicine, it's all about getting to the root cause. So the question also in this area is that what's at the root cause? Right. Do you guys need counseling? Right. Is there some deeper self-love right. stuff that's going on? Right. Is there something that's there that has to be looked at or could be looked at mm. which no... Uh, amount of money or implant or anything else or person can really solve for you. Yeah. And the thing I want to share on that is usually when we, well, for myself, I'm speaking for myself. When I got my implants, my insecurities just transferred to something else. And so when you don't heal the root cause, especially of the emotional problem, your insecurities are just going to get transferred. Mm. And so it's really important. And I always, Mm. for anyone that comes to me that says, I'm thinking about getting implants, I say, 
why don't you get a life coach or a health coach or someone who's going to work or even a therapist or whatever that's going to support you in looking at your why? What is your future vision of your life? What is what do you want to create? What is inspirational? What is creative for you? And then in six months, let's, you know, let's reevaluate or I would reevaluate then. But once you start doing the emotional work, you're actually going to realize that the emotion or the feeling you're trying to suppress with the implant can be healed a different way. And so I always say like, at least take six months or a year and dive into the research, look at other women's stories, go on the Facebook groups, not to scare you, but just to educate yourself of like, what could my potential be with implants and what could my potential future be without them? And so I'm all about, you know, research and educating yourself and being your own advocate for your health and getting multiple opinions. And, you know, and if you are getting them out, making sure to have a doctor that really truly believes what you are saying and isn't just about the financial exchange, but really believes mm. that your breast implant illness is an actual thing and believes in your symptoms and believes what you are telling them. Because I think to go under surgery is like one of the most vulnerable things and you want a doctor that believes you. Mm. Mm -hmm. That's well said. Uh, Dr. Kim, f final thoughts on this matter as a whole? You know, you and I, uh, we saw each other last week and I was sharing one of the interesting things about this, and and uh, I think this is a great podcast, not only for women, but but men and everybody mm -hmm. uh, to listen. And I think there's larger themes, and one of the themes you were talking about is that we just have to be aware of anything, whether it's placed in the body or the toxins we're exposed to. There's an there's an impact of it of it all. And uh, could you just talk about that for? A minute just like the greater awareness of the different things that impact our body and and what you'd want to leave people with to pay attention to when it comes to their health well one thing let me start off with is that you know we do have so many more uh insults that come to us in our society today which a lot of people are not aware of and these are very well-meaning people who are trying to do their best you know, as far as what they eat and what they drink, what they expose themselves to, but unknowingly, they don't even know that there's all these, you know, say toxins, uh, environmental toxins uh, that could be affecting their health. So it is important to educate yourself if you can about uh, about those things and realize that they are having an impact. Um, and again, depending on how good your all your detox pathways and you know things are working, um, it can it can impact you sooner or later. You know, so what I used to tell people, uh, our patients, you know, the insurance policy is over usually around 40. This is why I used to say 10 years ago. So usually around 40 is when I start to see people getting, you know, health issues starting. Now I'm seeing 20 year olds having those same issues that for you, you know, I would that would start when you're 40 in the in your 20s. And we're talking cancer as well. You know, I was treating a lot of cancer patients in my other practice before I came to Infusio. And we started seeing all these very young patients in their 20s with cancer. It was unbelievable. And you have to answer, ask the question, what is going on? There's something going on. Because being in practice, you know, I haven't been practiced forever, but I've been practiced long enough that this did, wasn't happening even 10 years ago. It's new. It's new. So, you know, we, we, we kind of then have to say, what is going on? What are the possible root causes, again, of these, uh, you know, what we're seeing, these different phenomena that we're seeing? So this is kind of where we, you know, we look to see what are the possible root causes. And um, I think for, for, you know, cancer and for a lot of these other health issues, uh, I would say there's big issues with env environment, environmental impact um, on people and the different the toxin exposures that we are in. That's going to, what are the big smoking guns again? I would, I'll call it right now. It's kind of like, I call it like similar to like smoking is the electromagnetic radiation. Um, that is huge with 5G coming out. Yeah. Um, you know, the, these, the electromagnetic radiation is able to penetrate and damage cells. Okay. And it's already been shown that 5G is not compatible with, you know, our bodies. Uh, and so the studies are there, but it's being ignored. And so, you know, it's being launched and it's going to have an impact. It is already having impact. Uh, and this is, again, uh, it can be sometimes difficult for patients to grasp that because they can't see it, uh, mm. but they feel it. 
but it's very nebulous. And so this is something that we actually pick up both through genetic testing. Some individuals are more genetically susceptible to the EMFs, and we can also see it on the global diagnostic scan. We can see there's actually it tells you if there's um, EMFs that are uh, causing uh, some disruption in the body. So we're seeing it very frequently, especially a lot of our patients just you know fly in and they get off the plane. Lots of EMFs on the plane and then it's like you know red. <laughs> so it's showing that they they're being affected by it. So uh, this the awareness is rising, but you know in, in Europe, this is already there's studies shown that it's dangerous and a lot of people are aware of it. Uh, France spent, I forget how many um, millions or billions of dollars uh, taking the Wi-Fi out of all of the schools and mm. doing hardwiring again. Uh, so, you know- Because kids especially, because their skull yes, size is not as big, Absolutely. More yeah, I have a big concern for all the children because all the kids, the schools now, are all Wi-Fi'd out. Uh, so, you know, they're on their computers and their phones. And, you know, uh, I had a school teacher who was a, a patient of mine, and I was mentioning this to her, and she was feeling better in the summer when she was on break. As soon as she went back to school, she noticed that she wasn't feeling as well with all of being surrounded by that. So again, and she's an adult. When you're younger, you do your yeah exactly. Your skulls are not as thick. It can definitely have more of an impact. Uh, so you know this is one of the other environmental impacts that uh, you know we've been looking at and. That might be another, I don't know if you've already done a podcast on that, but that's another <laughs> good topic. And I think one that is, you know, there is some awareness of it, but not yeah. really not very much awareness of it. Yeah. In our, in our series, it's, uh, that will have actually already come out by the time this podcast goes oh, live. Oh, great. We, we have uh, an entire episode on toxins and we bring in um, uh a uh, really incredible expert, I'm blanking on his name, but uh, a physician, a pediatrician who then got into and got his degree in physics and is a PhD and is doing a lot of research around this and, and awareness mm. in uh, Texas, in Austin, Texas. Great. And one of the things that he advocates for is that we definitely know, because it can be a little overwhelming because people are like, especially if you live in New York, you open up your, you know, you try to connect to a Wi-Fi network, you see like 50,000 of them all around you. Mm-hmm. He says, but the most important thing is that at least at night. At night when your body, for a long time, in, we didn't know why people slept. We didn't know the exact mechanisms of why the human body and why it needed sleep. And then we understood that, oh, actually there's cells that are going out there and collecting garbage and doing DNA repair and everything like that that's happening at night mm-hmm. in particular. Mm-hmm. So he said, especially at night, your room, when your body is in repair mode, has to be EMF free to the greatest extent possible and partly that's turning off the wi-fi mm-hmm. but also unplugging things that are next to your bed and potentially in older houses having your house tested for voltage seepage that's just electricity that's running through if your head if your bed mm-hmm. is right next to your wall mm-hmm. and a lot of emf comes from just older right. electricity houses that weren't uh wired correctly uh, it can feel like a lot, you know, as people are starting to dig into it. But I'm glad that we're raising the awareness and telling people to pay attention because this is all just one big, giant human experience. Mm-hmm. Right. Uh, experiment. Sorry, not experience. We're all kind of lab rats in this experiment. Right. And I think things will look a lot different in the future. Exactly. So, like, the EMF could be affecting, you know, uh, a chronic illness, uh, on top of that, you know, can be making amplifying the symptoms. So that's one thing I want to, uh, pay, uh, people to be aware of, in of itself being a problem. Mm-hmm. Uh, so that's generally the case because generally when we look at different uh, problems, we're looking at them individually. Right. We don't even know what the effect is if you put them all together. Mm-hmm. So, you know, that's probably, there's synergy that's happening, um, I'm sure. So that's where we also, when we treat patients, we want to uh, treat all these different areas. You know, you kind of have to look at everything. You can't just focus on detox. You can't just focus on the immune system. We kind of have to look at everything because we're being bombarded from all different angles. It's, and again, you may present with one specific issue, but it may be that this is other issue is also making your symptoms worse or impacting uh, your illness, uh, and you might not realize that. 
So that's especially true, like say with the EMFs, again, it also, if you have an infection, uh, it makes the uh, microorganisms kind of go crazy because they sense that. Mm. So Fascinating. And yeah, we could do a podcast on that in the future. Sarah, for you, you know, you work with a lot of women mm-hmm. and whether they've have implants or not, how, how has this changed your approach? How does this sort of change your practice or, mm-hmm. or has it had any impact at all yes, with the women that 100%. you work with? Yeah, I think whenever you go through something that impacts the physical and mental, emotional side of things, right? I had 10 years of eating disorders. So the work that I do is a lot around um, just embodying the belief that your body is perfect the way it is and loving yourself exactly the way you are and still empowering yourself to be healthy, right? Because I think right now there's a lot of sabotage around like love yourself the way you are, but then neglect actually doing anything for your health. And so for me, this whole experience is really about advocacy. It's about empowering myself to say, even when the doctor said no, I still kept going and going and going. It's about that even with all the health knowledge that I had, I was still not immune to getting sick, right? Because of my implants. There were so many lessons that I experienced and, you know, it's, it's, but the biggest thing for me, it was just the compassion component of really understanding our dieting industry, understanding what is supposedly expected of women and to look beautiful and young and to not age. And just, it just opened my eyes to a whole nother world that I knew from the fashion industry, but I also had kind of turned a blind eye because I was I was out of it, right? And this kind of reopened that experience of saying, wow, I really need to step back in this and start having this conversation. And right now working on a book that is all about this. And so it definitely pushed me to, to go back and dive into the old, you know, where I was a while ago and realize that I wasn't healed. And things will come up that you think you've healed that you haven't yet and that's okay it's a beautiful message sarah thank you uh for being on the podcast dr kim thank you for being here uh want to go to both of you uh uh starting with dr kim uh, how can people learn more about you where can they find about you and fusio if you just would share a little bit about how could, people could be in touch if they want to work with you or come out come check out the center oh sure yes so we do have a website infusio.org uh, and we have a lot of information there, um, including the number that you can contact us at. Um, that's probably the best way. And on there, there's um, some informational uh, videos and Q&As that we have. So that'll kind of give you information about what we do. Uh, so we do, we focus primarily on chronic degenerative illnesses. So we have the patients, generally the patients that I see, have already seen many, many doctors been told that they don't have a problem or they they can't find anything, that they're crazy, uh, so it's in their head. So these are the typical patients that we see. So actually, Sarah was a very typical patient <laughs> for me. <laughs> so, uh, you know, I'm kind of used to that. So, you know, we're very uh, understanding. We really do understand patients and we really we believe them because we know it's real. Mm-hmm. And there's a center that's here in uh, Los Angeles, and there's also a center that's in mm-hmm. um, in Europe, right? Correct. So we have a location here in Beverly Hills, and the there's another location in Frankfurt, Germany. Great. Also called Infusio. Called Infusio, correct. So most of the European patients will go to Germany because it's easier, and you, we have U.S. patients, a lot of Canadians actually. Um, they have even more issues <laughs> uh, up there getting health care. Uh, so we have a lot of those type of patients that come. I thought you were saying Canadians just have more issues in general. Oh, no, no, no. I, like, no. I love Canadians. Nice. I love I, I actually <laughs> love my Canadian patients. I'm yeah. talking about their healthcare system yeah. really limits, limits uh, yeah. even more than here. Because right? if you think it's tough here, well, you should see what they have to deal with. Oh, it's true. It's true. <laughs> so you're also in a Netflix documentary called Afflicted. Uh, can you tell us just a little bit more about that? Sure. So uh, Afflicted takes you through the life of this one patient who's trying to search and figure out what is wrong with her. So she visits all these different places and gets evaluations. So she, you know, they brought her over to our uh, place and I interviewed her. So that's really my part in Afflicted. Fantastic. Sarah, I want to come over to you. Uh, 
you have a private practice. Mm -hmm. You work with people all over. Mm -hmm. uh, tell us a little bit about it and how people can uh, reach out to you if they want to work with you. Yeah, so anyone can find me just on my website, which is Sarah, S-A-R-A-H-A-N-N-E, Stuart.com. Um, S T E W A R T, and you can all my social media links. Everything's there. Um, so the backstory on how I got involved in the holistic health space was that my father was diagnosed with terminal cancer. He cured himself with food. At the same time, I was scouted to model. I developed a series of ten years of eating disorders. Almost lost my own life to um, mm -hmm. anorexia and laxative abuse, and then had to really find my way back to holistic health and went back to school and re-educated myself. But the interesting thing was the more nutrition information I got, the worse my anxiety around food got. And so I had to come back to mindfulness and meditation and really embodying a belief that I was enough and this whole story of worthiness that we're being confronted with right now culturally. And so that's the work I do today is, is the mindfulness approach piece of the puzzle, which I think is really the missing hack between you know knowing what we need to do and actually doing it. Mm. Well said. And you mentioned it earlier, but you have a, you are uh, have a book coming out with Hay House. Yes. And it comes out in uh, 2020. 2020. Yes, I have a book that really discusses this topic and discusses the mindset shifts that need to take place culturally for the younger generations of women that are coming up who are looking to celebrities as their mentors versus really looking inside and saying, what is my own truth and what um, and how do I become an advocate for my own health? Hmm. Beautiful. And in the meantime, while they wait for your book, they can find you on uh, Instagram. You're pretty yes. active over there. Yes. And I will get back to anyone who DMs me. So again, Sarah Ann Stewart. Fantastic. Thanks. Sarah Ann, thank you so much for coming on the podcast. Dr. Kim, thank you. This was actually really beautiful. This is the first time that we've had uh, a, a patient mm -hmm. and, and mm -hmm. their doctor on the podcast and uh, sharing the story and advocating for not just women, but everybody, for anybody that's cares about their health, that's passionate, wants to get to the root cause, and and people that are out there that are listening, and even if they don't have these health issues that we've talked about, you know, they have a loved one who does. Mm -hmm. And how can they advocate for them? How can they share awareness with them? So thank you both for being on here and educating our listeners. Uh, it was a true pleasure. Thank you so much for having thank us. Thank you so, so much. Great.